what may be the hottest year in history, scientists have recorded radical changes to the permafrost in Antarctica. The Pandora virus, a so-called giant virus with the largest genome size ever recorded. The crabs also display increased aggression, even towards larger predators. A striking new weather anomaly has claimed many coastlines around the world. NASA is examining these clouds to figure out... We've detected large amounts of an organic composite. So far, the sample doesn't match any of the DNA records we've compared it with. We all saw it. Those creatures coming out of the sea on that oil rig. The president has declared a national emergency... It's obvious that what we're dealing with here is a biological weapon. As of today, we are at war. It's taking their minds. I saw them walk right into the sea. Thousands of people. Thousands. The mist is gone, but the city is dead. The roads are broken. You must join one of the havens. Do not attempt to survive on your own. Of all the words that could be used to describe the end of the world, Sophia didn't think boring would be one of them. But the truth was, that was the perfect word to describe it. Ungodly boring. She and Jacob would take turns manning the radio, desperately hoping an order would come from on high. But it hadn't. The pair had been manning the supply station for months now, though it felt like an eternity to Sophia. And apart from a weekly check-in from Phoenix Point, the radio was entirely silent. Their job was easy enough provide shelter and supplies to any Phoenix operatives passing through the area. But none had passed through in weeks. The only visitors they received were the occasional group of bandits who were easily scared off when they heard the roar of Sophia and Jacob's assault rifles. No doubt the vagabonds decided there was easier prey they could descend upon. Sophia felt that annoying twinge of guilt as she stared at Jacob manning the radio. His feet rested on the desk his hands comfortably behind his head, seemingly not a care in the world. He was always so laid back, and even though he had never complained once about their posting, which was most certainly a punishment for the duo, Sophia knew he was unhappy. Just like her, he hadn't joined the project to sit around guarding tins of food. And the truth was, it was Sophia's fault they were there. She had experienced a disagreement of sorts with her superior officer, Captain Cassius had decided he needed Sophia to remain at the base with him and to not accompany their leader, Randolph Symes, on his next expedition. Cassius claimed it was because her and Jacob were two of the best operatives he had, and the base needed a contingent of competent troops in their leader's absence. However, Sophia suspected the actual reason was much pettier than that. Sophia idolised Symes, and it was her dream to accompany him. He had become withdrawn and recluse for weeks, and the entire Phoenix Project knew that meant only one thing. He was on the verge of a great discovery. Sophia was crushed when she was told she wouldn't be joining Symes on their great crusade. Everyone at the base knew Sophia was one of Symes' favourites, and, no doubt, this jealousy had gotten the best of Cassius. If he wasn't chosen to join the boss, he was going to make sure that Sophia wasn't either. Nevertheless, Sophia realised, with the benefit of hindsight of course, that punching Cassius in the jaw was an ill-advised way of handling the situation. She was exiled from Phoenix Point, relegated to the supply depot in the middle of nowhere. And Jacob, showing his usual infinite kindness and naivety, had insisted on accompanying her. He wasn't going to let the woman he loved rot out in the wilderness alone. No they would rot together instead. And then, without warning, Jacob sprang to his feet, shocked into action. The radio was no longer silent. We listened to the number stations every day. I took turns with Jacob, waiting for our signal. And finally, it came. A scarab got it too. It's AI directing it to our rendezvous point. We had no news from Symes for many months. Did he send the activation codes? I was desperate to know what happened to him. The mutants were on the march again. Something was happening. If the mist was back, then it meant that the Pandora virus was mutating again, twisting the human form into new horrors. We needed to regroup, rebuild. But first, 
We had to get to that scarab. While the radio's message was vague on the details, one thing was clear. Phoenix Point was in danger. All operatives in the field had been recalled to the base. Such a thing was unheard of for as long as Sophia had been a part of the organization. Whatever was going on, it was big. As Sophia and Jacob made their way to the scarab, they quickly raised their guard. It was the smell, the stench of sulfur and rotting flesh. They always smelled the Pandorans before they saw them. And sure enough, the creatures were infesting the area, the monstrosities of the mist. Though neither of them said it out loud, the presence of the Pandorans so far inland made both Sophia and Jacob deeply unsettled. Normally the vile beasts remained near the coastal regions. Something wasn't right. Nevertheless, there was no time to ponder such questions. The duo's lives were at stake. Sophia and Jacob fired up their assault rifles, and a stream of bullets ripped the Pandorans apart. This wasn't the pair's first time dealing with these beasts, and months of inactivity had left them both itching for a fight. The Pandorans, on this day, were slaughtered. And once the final beast was gone, Jacob entered the scarab to perform a systems check. The device was old, but fully functional. This was an incredible stroke of luck. Their journey would now take only days, rather than weeks. After several hours traveling, the howling noises stopped, and then so did the scarab. I did a quick survey around our position while Jacob talked to the AI. There was an abandoned government reclamation station nearby. These places are usually good for scavenging supplies and equipment, but they often attracted desperate gangs. The AI gave us the reason for our stop. An emergency rescue signal from another Phoenix operative. We had a location too, right in the middle of that station. The Scarab made it clear that we should attempt a rescue before continuing with our journey. Despite no sign of the mutants, our comrade was clearly under threat. The Scarab's missile launcher would prove very useful. Omar's team had also received the distress signal from Phoenix Point, and they had agreed to abandon their scavenging mission and return to HQ immediately. Whoever sent the message was clearly in a panic, and the situation was no doubt an emergency. The team was so heavily focused on the distress signal that they got sloppy. Normally their leader Michael would have detected an ambush from lowly bandits like it was nothing, but he was distracted. They all were. And for their error... They were gunned down in seconds by raiders. Omar's heavy armor kept him alive during the initial wave of gunfire, granting him witness to his entire squad's demise. More out of instinct than anything else, he let rip his jetpack and barreled into a nearby structure. He and his sole autocannon had managed to hold off the bandits for several hours, but they were no doubt regrouping and planning their next assault and once they launched it, it wouldn't take them long to realize that he was out of ammo. Omar was trapped and defenseless. His end approached with utmost certainty. At least that's what he thought, until a Phoenix Project scarab rolled up next to the window of the building. He was greeted by a fiery redhead who introduced herself as Sophia. Omar couldn't believe his luck as the scarab rained down heavy ordnance on his pursuers on the people who murdered his friends. Somehow, it seemed he was going to live through this day after all. Omar explained he was sure there was ammo left on the site. It was the reason the team was there in the first place, but he hadn't been able to secure any before the ambush. Sophia ordered him to retrieve whatever he could while she and Jacob would cover him. Once Omar's autocannon was again fully loaded, the time for vengeance was at hand. He descended upon the bandits, pummeling them with autocannon fire. The raiders found themselves at a mismatch, and soon, none of them remained breathing. Omar thanked Sophia and Jacob for saving his life, and informed the pair of what had happened to his team. They offered their sympathies, and Sophia said there was another Phoenix squad that could use his help, if he was willing to give it. Omar joined the pair in the Scarab, and the now trio raced to Phoenix Point at top speed. After the battle, the Scarab resumed its course towards our base, struggling through the rough terrain. Strange growths were contorting the road, smashing against its armor. It wasn't long before it took one too many hits. The engine gave a loud crack and the AI went dark. 
We had lost a valuable member of the team. We knew we were close to our destination, but we didn't know what we would find there. If we were to advance on foot, we had to exercise extreme caution. Approaching the base, we heard gunshots. Jacob and Omar took positions by my side. What was going on inside? A bandit ambush or something much worse? Following Phoenix protocol, we readied our weapons. It is time to reclaim our home. Upon reaching the base on foot, the stench overwhelmed the team. That familiar reek of Pandorans. But it was different this time. Stronger than Sophia had ever encountered. It was clear. The base was under siege. Over six months had passed since Sophia had set foot in this place, and this was the last thing she wanted for her homecoming. Once the sound of gunfire rang out, the team double-timed it into the base. There might yet be survivors. They soon discovered an expert sharpshooter in Irina. She had been cornered by poison worms, but the squad was able to quickly fight them off. Irina informed the group the survivors had agreed to meet in the hangar to escape the base in the Manticore. She had been unable to reach the hangar due to being cut off by enemy forces. The team agreed the hangar was their number one priority, and they began their journey. The base was riddled with narrow corridors and tight corners. The team moved hastily, but carefully, laying down suppressing fire on the multitude of Pandorans charging them. Inside the hangar, the scene was a slaughter. Only a single Phoenix soldier remained, and he had been taken over by a Mindfragger, an insidious Pandoran beast that would take control of a victim's nervous system, turning them into a living meat puppet of the monsters. With reckless abandon, Sophia threw herself over the guard railing and charged at the operative. She smashed the butt of her rifle into the Mindfragger, turning it into a rancid paste. Underneath the gunky remains of the creature was Takeshi, a veteran of the Phoenix Project, universally respected amongst the troops and civilians alike. He thanked Sophia for her assistance, but chastised her for her recklessness. He suspected the Pandorans had left him alive as bait, and the pair were now very likely surrounded. Takeshi's concerns proved true as the Pandorans began rallying around them. Sophia assured Takeshi they would both be fine, she had brought backup. And so the Phoenix operatives unleashed hellfire upon their foe. The Pandorans were blown to pieces as quickly as they could emerge from the dark. The concrete floor of the hangar littered with their insides. Phoenix Point had been saved. While most of the civilians had made it to the Manticore and were safely inside during the attack, the military personnel of Phoenix Point had sustained massive losses. Irina and Takeshi were the only survivors. The rest of the soldiers had fallen, buying the civilians the time they needed to make it to safety. The rage built in Sophia. If their scarab had just lasted a little bit longer, perhaps those people would still be alive. Takeshi reassured her that if her team hadn't arrived when they did, everyone in the base would be dead. He told her that all their lives, and Phoenix Point itself, were still intact because of her. Takeshi also informed Sophia that Cassius's team had gone missing in the field, presumed dead. Their manticore had been destroyed and their bodies nowhere to be found, no doubt turned into Pandorans. And since Symes hadn't returned from his expedition, and no one had heard from him in months, Sophia was now the highest ranking officer in the Phoenix Project. The base, and its personnel, were hers to command. The Phoenix Project was founded on October 24th, 1945. The Second War to end all wars was over, but there were those who understood that we could no longer afford to think in terms of nations and empires. For a time, the Phoenix Project successfully navigated the political conflicts of its era. That was our golden age. Phoenix Project operatives scoured the world for clues. We had bases in two dozen countries, even the heavens were not off limits. But out there, on the far side of the moon, began our downfall. The failure of the Phoenix 2 mission exposed us to our enemies in the UN. Stripped of resources and scattered to the winds, we were reduced to a secret, a memory. When the Pandora virus woke up, we should have been the first line of defense. 
when huge clouds of mist appeared over the sea, when people started vanishing, we should have figured out what was going on. And when those people started coming back, changed, hostile, alien, we should have been ready to fight, but we failed. The ecosystem started to change, imperceptibly at first, then faster and faster. Three factions arose. New Jericho, trying to restore order and purity. Sinedrin, hoping to build a world without hierarchies. And the Disciples of Anu, a new syncretic religion dedicated to adaptation and biological change. At war with the world and at odds with each other, these factions cannot find a way forward. Now the mist is returning and armies are rising from the sea. Without the Phoenix Project, humanity will fall. It's time to rise from the ashes. Rebuilding the Phoenix Project would be no easy task. They had gone from dozens of operatives with military training to five. And while the base was intact, it had sustained heavy damage. The computers, the hard drive, the satellite uplink, all of it had been destroyed during the battle, and the knowledge these systems contained had been similarly lost. Phoenix Point was now little more than a battered port in an infinite and hostile storm. Saving the world seemed outright ridiculous given the dire circumstances. It would have been easy to lose hope, but the team knew they had to remain strong. The civilians were counting on them. Sophia decided there were two things the project needed right now more than anything if it were to ever get back on track. Resources and allies. Sophia led the five-man squad on their first official mission, a supply raid on an old government facility. Pandorans were present at the site, but Sophia was fine with that. The truth was, she was eager for the chance at some revenge. The rest of the team seemed to feel the same way as they laid waste the Pandoran menace. They annihilated the creatures while securing the supplies. The outing proved an overwhelming success at a crucial juncture. The supplies would allow repairs at the base to commence and no doubt lift the crew's spirits. Once radio communications were working again, the Disciples of Anu contacted Phoenix Point. They were requesting assistance with what they referred to as a worm infestation at the haven known as Masuari. While the Phoenix operatives were no doubt spread thin when it came to manpower, Sophia understood the importance of forming friendships and alliances so the team once again deployed to the field. Masuari was a run-down little village, a far cry from the grand structures of the Anu capitals. Shanties and garbage littered the area, no doubt the ideal environment for toxic worms. One of the creatures burrowed its way out of a trash pile, catching Jacob off guard. He shielded himself as best as possible from the blast, but the worm still covered him in toxic sludge as it exploded. He grunted in pain as the medkit did its job sealing his wounds and ejecting the poison out of his paws. The team continued laying down fire into the worms. The creatures continuously swarmed the squad for as long as they could, but eventually it seemed every last worm had been exterminated. The haven was safe, at least for now. Upon the team's victory, the townsfolk exited their homes to greet them. Their faces showed joy and appreciation, but their bodies lurched awkwardly back and forth as they circled around the group. They're dancing, Takeshi mused. The disciples closed in on Sophia, some brushing their hands against her face and hair. She was clearly unimpressed, but the townsfolk were most certainly harmless, so she begrudgingly endured the bizarre ceremony. Then they began chanting, every last villager, all in unison, chanting of the great terror from the sky. There was an uneasy silence as the team returned to the manticore. Something about the village's words, the moon is dark and the gods dance in the night, it left a sinking feeling in all their stomachs. But nonetheless, while their new friends seemed like a strange bunch, they were friends all the same, and everyone on the team was wise enough to know that they were currently the beggars who couldn't afford to be choosers. 
It was this same line of reasoning that led the group to the marketplace, as its patrons described it. Such a place would have been referred to as a black market in the old world. But in a land with no governments, who was to say what was a legal sale or an illegal one? The mad maker, the man in charge of the marketplace, certainly didn't bother himself with such distinctions. He had a lot of tech, some his own and some acquired from Havens, and all of it excited the team greatly. While his moral compass may have been questionable, his potential usefulness to the project was not. That much was obvious. So when he requested the team retrieve an old scarab for him, they were happy to curry the favour. Upon arriving at the site, Omar soared across the rooftops, eager to access the garage's control panel. Once he had released the locks on the scarab, Jacob would perform a systems check. He was the most tech-savvy of the team. But Omar was too boisterous in his movements, not properly scouting the ground ahead and finding himself landing amidst a plethora of Pandorans. Takeshi provided cover while Sophia and Jacob double-timed it to Omar's position. Jacob's body ached like he was being covered in toxic slime all over again as he struggled to keep up with Sophia. The team leader pushed on as if pain was a mere myth, something that didn't really exist. Short of the bones in her legs shattering, she would allow nothing to stand between her and reaching her teammate. As Omar retreated from a mindfragger, the beast seemed to sense Sophia's hostility, as if it knew the unbridled, murderous intention she held for it. Using her own momentum against her, the beast threw itself onto her face. In an instant, Sophia was rendered completely motionless. She had been taken by the creature. At the same time, Pandorans continued closing in on Omar. Jacob had barely been able to keep up with Sophia, but he had managed it all the same. He pulverized the Minefragger with his rifle and pushed forward as Sophia projected the last bits of the monster out of her throat. The Pandorans appeared to be trying to flank the trio, but Takeshi beat them at their own game, inflicting massive damage on one of the biped monstrosities. While the team did sustain injuries in the exchange, they successfully fended off the Pandoran's assault. But it seemed for every one of the foul beasts they destroyed, another one appeared. No doubt the creatures were being drawn towards the sound of the gunfire. Sophia realised the longer the team stayed here, the worse the situation would become. She commanded Omar to take position atop the radio tower, while she sprinted to the control panel herself. Once Jacob activated the Scarab's AI, the tide of the battle quickly turned. Just like the bandits before them, the Pandorans had no answer for the Scarab's heavy firepower. And so the team was once again successful. The glint in the Mad Maker's eyes as the team delivered the vehicle was, as Irina so eloquently described it once they were back aboard the Manticore, goddamn creepy. However, that wasn't before the Maker had, in his exorbitant joy, offered another job to the team, to steal an armadillo from New Jericho. Between the depraved look on the Maker's face, and not wanting to make enemies of Tobias West, Sophia very firmly declined the offer. The Mad Maker's disappointment was clearly immense, but he understood their reasoning. And with the bizarre exchange behind them, the team returned to the base. Upon their arrival, the civilians were buzzing with excitement. They had repaired many of the base's systems and even cracked into some of Randolph Syme's personal files. This had resulted in some most exciting discoveries. Randolph Symes was the last leader of the Phoenix Project. His great-grandfather had been there when it was founded, and he was there to witness its end. When we took back Phoenix Point, we found his notes. In his final days, as the world collapsed around him, he had been working frantically to understand the Pandora virus. Somewhere in the complicated history of the project, in decades of missions and investigations, there had to be an answer. His notes were damaged, too many of the files corrupted. But perhaps, if we could retrace his steps, we could figure out where his journey had taken him, and what the answers he had discovered would mean for us. Having the base's communication systems back online was a huge boon for the project. The location of multiple Phoenix bases was now available to them. 
And even better than that, the bases could be activated remotely. While it would take time to move personnel into these facilities, the AI running each base would still prove very useful. It would provide the Phoenix Project satellite coverage over huge chunks of the globe, allowing them to monitor the mist and Pandoran movements. The valuableness of this intel could not be understated. But that wasn't the only thing the engineers had discovered. While the computer systems had been heavily damaged in the attack, the Phoenix personnel were able to recover fragments of Syme's personal files. The data contained a location housing the Symes family personal estate. Sophia had known Randolph to visit this place on several occasions, but he had never divulged its location to anyone, at least not that she knew of. Sophia's hunger for answers instantly consumed her. There was no time for rest. The team were heading out once more. It was a curious thing as the team arrived at the Symes family retreat. The premises appeared to be deserted, yet as the team moved into the building proper, without warning, Pandoran started encircling them. It was as if the beasts had been waiting for them, an ambush, as it were. Sophia had always dismissed the creatures as mindless abominations running on instinct and nothing more. But the attack at the base, and now this, was leaving a vile sinking feeling within her. What would the implications be if the Pandorans were capable of reason. It was a terrifying thought. Thankfully, the rumble of gunfire and the shrieks of anguish from exploding Pandorans eased her fears. The greatest strategic questions of the Pandorans' newfound intelligence could be dwelled upon later. Right now, the team was fighting for their lives, and that was a fight she intended to win. Once the last of the creatures were put down, Omar jumped to the roof to secure the files from Syme's computer. The chase was well and truly ready to begin. As the world fell apart around us, it was difficult not to feel guilty. Some chose to be proactive and fight, but not me. I came here instead. My best weapon is my mind, and I need silence to put it to work. The history of the Phoenix Project is a complex tapestry. In Russia, Turkey, Britain, Spain, not one unbroken lineage, but a tangle of organizations, each passing the torch to the next with only one goal, to protect the human race. But protected from what? Did they know about the Pandora virus? And if so, how? The answers are out there. So much has been investigated and collected and analyzed, but it's all scattered, lost. I don't know if it's possible to track it all down, but I have to try. There's only one thing I'm sure of. I can't stay here anymore. Syme's data entries pointed to three locations, sites that he had intended to visit when he left the base. Finally, Sophia had a genuine lead as to Syme's whereabouts, and even better, one of them was nearby. In his essays, my great-grandfather recounts the story of the ill-fated Chinling Bashan expedition of 1915 and the journal of Lei Meng, the leader of the mission, who found evidence of a forgotten proto-civilization deep below the ground. There is also mention of James Dawson, a British photographer who stole most of the precious samples recovered by the team. What became of Dawson has always been a mystery, but now I know the mundane truth. He died here in the mountains, forgotten and alone. This proto-civilization, could it hold the key to defeating the Pandora virus? They say history repeats itself. Has all of this happened before? While the archaeological dig site had most certainly been visited by Symes, there was no trace of him now. All that was left was ruins, the design of which was inhuman. Who had built these bizarre, seemingly alien-like structures? And more important, where had they gone? Disappointed, but still clinging to hope, Sophia led the team back to the base. The other two sites were much further away, and the team would need to both stock up on supplies and chart an appropriate course for the journey. It wasn't long, however, before their planning was interrupted. A transmission had arrived from Sinedrion. A group of bandits had infiltrated the haven of Ginsburg and were planning on stealing valuable Sinedrion technology. While the bureaucrats bickered about the best way to deal with the situation, a rogue Sinedrion operative had requested the project's help. 
he knew by the time the Sinedrion Council had made a decision, the thieves would be long gone. And so the team once again set out in the manticore. This time it was Jacob who moved out too far too quickly, and found himself getting pummeled with pistol fire from the thieves. Bullets whizzed past his head as he frantically ducked for cover. It was only after the first one smashed through his shoulder blade that the gravity of the situation dawned on him. The bandits were not going to stop raining fire down upon him until he was dead, or until they were. With a mighty roar, Jacob threw himself to his feet and began laying down fire across the battlefield. Pistol bullets continued swarming him, some bouncing off his armour, others penetrating through to his flesh. By the time he rid the bandits of their ability to breathe, his armour was stained red from the rivers of blood that ran down it. It was all he could do to fire off his med kit before unconsciousness took him. Sophia held Jacob tightly for the entire ride back to the base, while scorning him for his recklessness every step of the way, of course. I was just doing what you would have, he joked through splutters of blood. Needless to say, this only caused Sophia to scold him more. Jacob would survive his wounds, but he would need a great deal of R&R. &R. Without warning, the entire team was violently thrown to the side of the manticore as the ship whirled frantically off course. An enormous pressure had turned the vehicle on its side, upending everything within. What the hell was that? Omar spat as the ship's stabilizers kicked in and the team regained their equilibrium. Takeshi was fixated on the window, the color of his skin draining to that of a ghost in real time. What was this giant mass from the sky, and why was it here now, just after the mist had returned? It couldn't be a coincidence. Something terrible was at work, and it filled Sophia with a dread she had never known before. When Takeshi finally turned away from the window, his eyes conveyed the same feelings that currently plagued Sophia. Masuari, he drawled, seemingly in a trance. The terror from the sky. It's exactly what the villagers at Masuari warned us about. Mount Egg was what the celestial object had been nicknamed. Over the following days, Pandoran activity increased drastically, as if the creatures were being stirred into a frenzy by the Egg's presence. The Anu Haven of Shurapak had found itself the victim of the Pandoran's agitated state. Once again, the team was ready to embark. Jacob insisted he was combat ready, having spent several hours being stitched back together in the medical bay. Sophia was hesitant, but Jacob reminded her that the Pandorans had been growing increasingly aggressive since the arrival of the Egg. The team couldn't afford to sit him out. Sophia agreed Jacob could accompany the team under the strict condition he didn't try to play the hero again. Jacob was happy to oblige. With the assistance of the Phoenix operatives, the Haven was able to repel the creatures. And in doing so, a rare opportunity had been provided to the team. The Phoenix Point satellite array had been able to detect the attacker's point of origin. The project had the location of a Pandoran nest. The team was buzzing with excitement. This was their chance to take the fight to the enemy, to hit the foul creatures where they live, to finally go on the offensive. The crew touched down inside the nest, the environment having been warped and mutated into a Pandoran monstrosity. The mission was clear, eliminate the sentinels hatching the Pandoran eggs, and eradicate anything that stood in their way. Upon the destruction of the sentinels, the remaining Pandorans either fled or started violently spasming until they were dead. The elimination of the egg hatches seemed to be having a psychological impact on the other creatures. It was a curious sight to behold. As the team were preparing to leave, Sophia stumbled across a most unusual find. A Phoenix Project data pad. What was such a device doing here? The team was intrigued. It turned out the device belonged to one Alexander Danchev a scientist who was exiled from Phoenix Point before Sophia's time for having methods that were deemed too extreme. 
Takeshi recalled the name, noting the other Phoenix operatives had taken to calling him the Mad Scientist. He was a man obsessed with the Pandorans, even bringing live specimens into the base. And of course, the beasts eventually broke their containment. Fortunately, no one was killed in the outbreak, but Danchev was banished, and all Phoenix operatives banned from ever cooperating with the man. The truth was, Sophia felt for Danchev. She understood how a lack of forethought could lead one to being exiled by their peers. It was, perhaps, this sympathy which drove her curiosity of Danchev. The datapad listed several other locations that the mad scientist had apparently visited. She was eager to discover what he had been up to. And the journey worked out well for the team, as Danchev's coordinates were not far from one of the ones mentioned in Syme's files. That had to take priority. In 2022, a group of researchers investigating an anthrax outbreak caused by melting permafrost in northern Siberia went missing. The Phoenix Project tried to find out what happened to them, but our resources were stretched too thin, and our allies in the Russian government were losing influence, so we let it go. All these years later, looking at these samples, I wonder, is this where it started? Is this the first outbreak? If we had done more, could we have stopped it? The genetic material I have recovered might hold the answers, but I'm not sure I want to know. Sadly, there was still no sign of science, only frozen scientists that looked like they met a most painful end. The squad's search would need to continue. Their next destination was a cave system inhabited by Pandorans. This was the place Danchev's coordinates had led them to. Danchev had left some tools behind, but just like Symes, there was no trace of the man himself. All that remained were abominations. It seemed the Pandorans had not expected human presence in this place, as the creatures seemed relatively pacified. The squad caught them off guard and paved the walls with their blood. Once the beasts were disposed of, Sophia began making her way deeper into the cave. The squad hurried to keep up with her, believing for certain they were going to get lost. But Sophia knew exactly where she was going. She soon led them to a small chamber with a most bizarre set of artifacts. Danchev's nearby notes referred to them as the living armor. The suit appeared to be made of Pandoran tissue. Omar found it disgusting. The group was concerned when Sophia said she could hear the suit humming though the rest of the team experienced no such phenomenon. Sophia equipped the armor despite the rest of the team insisting against it. It's fine, she assured them. Sophia explained Danchev had left this place in a hurry, but she was sure he had other, similarly powerful weapons out there, and thanks to the data pad, she knew where to find them. Before that though, New Jericho had contacted the project for assistance. Tobias West himself claimed that the haven of Fort Methuselah had been experiencing raids at the hands of what he described as madmen. Sophia was eager to test her new armor in combat and happily agreed to lend support. Once the team found the hostiles, the truth became apparent. These were no mere savages as West had described them. They were highly trained and heavily armed military veterans. The Phoenix operatives were caught off guard. Takeshi was riddled with bullets by one of the soldiers, his left arm being rendered completely useless. As Takeshi fell helplessly to the floor, Sophia charged into the line of fire, mowing down their opponent. Jacob helped stabilize Takeshi as Sophia led the charge further into the complex. Her armor shrugged off the next trooper's attack like it was nothing. The living armor was proving to be quite the worthwhile investment. She was shocked to see Takeshi standing opposite her on the front line so suddenly. He may have only had one functional arm, but that's all he needed as he hurled the grenade directly at their foe. And shortly after, the last of the so-called madmen fell to Jacob's rifle. The squad was successful in this skirmish, but Sophia was consumed by anger. Tobias West was the leader of New Jericho, 
but that didn't stop Sophia screaming at him that he had set them up and nearly got Takeshi killed. West insisted that the men had been taken over by the Pandora virus. The conversation ended with Sophia declaring him a filthy liar, as she put it, and slamming the comms receiver down, shattering it to pieces. Jacob attempted to calm her, but that only made her more enraged. This behaviour concerned Jacob deeply. While Sophia had always been hot-headed, this was something else entirely. Sophia spent the rest of the journey back to Phoenix Point in annoyed silence. Takeshi needed rest, and the Manticore now needed repairs. However, upon arriving at the base, Sophia contacted the Mad Maker. She informed him she had experienced a change of heart to his request, and she was now more than happy to steal Tobias West's armadillo. Once Takeshi had been pieced back together in the medical bay, it wasn't long before the team was combat ready again. The squad protested Sophia's plan to steal the armadillo, but she simply stated she was going with or without them. Her teammates begrudgingly agreed to accompany her, but they insisted they were taking the armadillo and then escaping as quickly as possible. No one wanted a firefight with New Jericho. Sophia agreed, but was quite firm in her stance that if any New Jericho personnel got in her way, she would do what was required. Upon arriving at the site, the team was shocked to see Pandorans invading the Haven. The team wanted to help quell the menace, but Sophia ordered them to remain focused on the objective. She reminded them that they had entered the Haven without permission, and the new Jericho soldiers were just as likely to open fire on them as the Pandorans were. Jacob offered to battle his way to the Armadillo, but Sophia decided it was too dangerous. The number of Pandorans here was abnormally high, and their attack on the Haven was ruthless. The team was in grave danger every moment they stayed there. Instead, Omar would use his jetpack to quickly secure the armadillo, and Jacob would talk him through how to get it running via comms. Once he had secured the vehicle, Omar attempted to use its mighty firepower to assist the new Jericho soldiers. But this task simply proved too much. The Pandorans were swarming the area, ripping the blue-clad soldiers into pieces. The abominations even began pummeling the armadillo itself, smashing huge holes in its armor. Sophia screamed at Omar over the radio to rush to the evac zone. Reluctantly, he was forced to comply, falling back from the monsters. There were simply too many of them. The team fled the site as the haven was consumed. Omar was demoralized after the mission. He believed he could have done more to save the people there. Sophia reminded him that it was New Jericho who almost got Takeshi killed. She assured him those people were not his friends. As the Manticore made its way to the marketplace, Jacob uncovered a surprising discovery. The armadillo had encrypted information regarding one Helena Luansky. She had apparently been locked up in a New Jericho asylum due to her obsession with some sort of proto-civilization. Jacob was able to access much of her work, and the team was in agreement on one thing. Her theories, which Tobias West had labelled as the ravings of a lunatic, shared much in common with the unusual antediluvian ruins that Symes had visited. If Helena wasn't insane, it was likely she possessed valuable intel regarding this ancient civilization. This time, Sophia received no argument when she declared the team was visiting New Jericho once again. While no one had said it, the entire team knew. They were attempting to break into a high-security complex, and at this haven, there was no Pandoran invasion to serve as a distraction. The only way into the building was to go right through the New Jericho soldiers. Omar covered the squad, letting out a mighty war cry debilitating the New Jericho's troops' ability to coordinate attacks. This confusion gave the squad the time they needed to move in. Sophia ordered their foes to surrender, insisting they would be given only one opportunity to do so. But rather than surrender, all the squad received was a barrage of New Jericho pistol fire. Once the bullets started flying, the team's hesitation disappeared. 
instincts took over and they returned fire in a ruthless display. The team surrounded the building as Takeshi was the first to break his way inside. He shot apart the guard's rifle, leaving the soldier entirely defenseless. Takeshi ordered him to stand down, but it was too late. Sophia burst through the side window, spraying the guard full of bullets. Takeshi looked on in horror as Sophia pushed forward, locating Helena. Takeshi only stared at the lifeless guard in front of him. The man had, for all intents and purposes, been executed. I'll kill you for that. An angry roar came from above Takeshi. Another guard dropped from the balcony above, emptying his pistol at the Phoenix veteran. Out of pure reflex, Takeshi spun on the spot, pulling the trigger of his rifle and blasting the guard into nothing. It was only after the exchange Takeshi noticed the footprints his movements had left on the floor, footprints made of New Jericho blood. As Sophia checked on Helena, Takeshi vocalized his disgust with their actions. These weren't Pandorans or bandits, just men and women doing their jobs. What the Phoenix operatives had done here was nothing short of murder. Sophia coldly stated she had given the New Jericho personnel the chance to surrender, and they had refused. Takeshi rebutted, saying the unarmed guard was no danger. There was no reason to kill him. Sophia told Takeshi he was an idiot, and to look in the guard's hand. Sure enough, in the pale, lifeless grip of the guard was a combat knife. All it would have taken was a single slash to end Takeshi's life. How Sophia had been able to spot the weapon and respond in an instant while crashing through a window of glass at the same time seemed like an impossible feat to Takeshi. But he was a smart man and he quickly figured it out. This time, he was exceptionally calm when he spoke. That armor may provide you some incredible abilities, but it's turning you into a monster. Helena was grateful for her rescue and had joined the personnel of Phoenix Point. There, she was currently using the Phoenix Satellite Network to try and locate more antediluvian ruins. She was convinced some of them housed great power that could aid the project in their war against the Pandorans. Meanwhile, tensions in the squad had grown. Sophia and Takeshi were barely speaking, while the rest of the team were growing tired of Sophia's ongoing outbursts of aggression. Nevertheless, they had once again agreed to acquire a vehicle for the Mad Maker, this time a Sinedrion Aspida. The team had only consented since the Haven, and the vehicle within, had been long abandoned by the Sinedrions. All that was left now were Pandorans. Some of the Tritons had learned to manufacture mist from their bodies. They used this ability to cover themselves during their advance and flank the team. Even worse, some of them could also seemingly disappear into thin air as a pain response. Once the team hit them once, the beasts would vanish from sight. It seemed the creatures were not only becoming more aggressive since the arrival of the egg, but also much stronger. After the armadillo incident, Omar had discovered he actually had a passion for vehicle maintenance. He and Jacob had bonded over this mutual interest, and Omar was keen to secure the Aspida himself. Jacob made his way to the console controlling the device while the team covered him. Takeshi found himself flanked by one of the invisible tritons and again sustained heavy damage. Irina covered him, punching through the monster's brain with a high-powered shot. Once the Aspida was under their control, the team began to regroup around the vehicle. The Aspida was a powerful device, housing mechanical tentacles that could overwhelm a target's nervous system, paralyzing it in its tracks. The team evac'd the area with their prize, and once again, the Mad Maker was most impressed. The final favor he asked of the squad was obtaining a vehicle that belonged to him. His workshop had been attacked by Pandorans and he was forced to flee, leaving his latest invention behind. The team set out, battling their way through the monstrosities. 
They were prepared for the Pandoran stealth tactics this time, and the creatures found hiding within the concealment of mist to be a far less effective strategy. Omar used his jetpack to reach the keys of the vehicle, while the team served as bait, drawing the Pandoran's attention away from the big man. It wasn't long before Omar was in control of the affectionately named Chaos Buggy, and was obliterating the Pandorans with its heavy rifle. The workshop was secure, and the vehicle returned to its owner. There was genuine joy in the maker's eyes, like he had been reunited with an old friend. He officially declared the project an ally of the marketplace, and instructed all sellers to provide the team goods at cost price. The timing seemed perfect as the disciples of Anu requested the project's help with a bandit problem they were having. Apparently, these raiders were highly organised and a much more dangerous threat than the usual savages that roamed the wildlands. This gang had targeted several disciple envoys and had caused heavy losses. This mission would prove an excellent opportunity to test out the Maker's weapons and see if they were as powerful as he claimed. Irina took a sniper rifle, while, to the team's surprise, Sophia insisted Takeshi take the shotgun. She wished for Takeshi to trust her again, and this was the first step she was taking to achieve that end. And the Maker was indeed proven right. The power of these guns was immense. The team cut through the bandits with ease. In thanks, the disciples invited the team to a celebratory feast. Together, the disciples and the Phoenix operatives ate, drank, and, most importantly, laughed. For the first time in a long time, the squad was genuinely happy and appeared to be on the same page. As they returned to the base in the Manticore, it seemed they would finally be able to leave their troubles behind them. Fate, however, as is so often the case, had other plans. The comm system switched on without warning. While the audio crackled in and out, and the video was quite grainy, Sophia instantly knew who she was talking to, and her stomach dropped somewhere down near her knees. Captain Dante Cassius of the Phoenix Project was demanding their presence at Ginsburg, and he seemed very much alive. Cassius could best be described as a hardliner. He despised the disciples of Anu and saw their mutation technology as an affront to humanity. His philosophy had much in common with that of Tobias West. Before Phoenix Point had been attacked, his main priority had been recruitment. He and his team were eager to find as many soldiers capable and willing of joining the fight as they could. They were seeking a Disciples of Anu bounty hunter who called himself The Hammer. This man had a similar disdain of Anu mutations, and that had rendered him an understandable outcast in their society. A perfect candidate for Cassius' team. The Hammer had been hunting a group of Forsaken, another faction of Anu outcasts, but these ones were known for acts of extreme violence against their fellow countrymen. They were, for all intents and purposes, terrorists, and that had left a hefty price on their head. Hammer may not have shared Anu's beliefs, but he was more than happy to accept their payment. Before he could reach the Forsaken's hideout, Cassius' team intercepted him with an offer of ongoing payment in exchange for his service. Hammer agreed, and as the team tried to leave in the Manticore, it exploded. The Forsaken were well aware of their presence and had launched an ambush. The team were able to fight their way out and escape the attack, but they found themselves trapped in the wildlands, being pursued by mutated abominations, and with absolutely no way to contact their allies. It took them weeks to make it to Ginsburg on foot, but eventually they reached civilization, and the Synedrions had even offered to salvage and repair their manticore. Given his sympathies for New Jericho, when the team arrived in Ginsburg, Cassius was naturally unimpressed with their antics. He spent an exorbitant amount of time scolding them on what had been dubbed the Fort Justice Massacre, the day a Phoenix Project assault team laid siege to a New Jericho haven, killing innocent guards to break out a felon, not to mention their association with a criminal in the Mad Maker. Cassius was disgusted at the sight of the team wielding weapons made of stolen parts. 
Sophia argued that Helena was no criminal and had been locked up as a political prisoner since she was undermining West's narrative. She assured Cassius that the leader of New Jericho was not to be trusted. Cassius wasn't interested in hearing it. He chastised her for bringing the project to the brink of war with New Jericho. He labelled her as irresponsible and reckless. His team's manticore would be repaired within days, and once it was, he would return to the base to resume command. In the meantime, Sophia and her squad were to go nowhere near any New Jericho installations. Cassius showed disappointment in Takeshi. He thought the veteran would have known better than to follow the orders of an entitled fool like Sophia. Takeshi agreed that Sophia had made mistakes, but he also reminded the captain that she was the one who had held the entire project together when all hope seemed lost. She was the reason any of the Phoenix personnel were still breathing. Takeshi made it clear he was with Sophia, through thick or thin. On the ride back to base, Sophia, to most everyone's surprise, showed no signs of anger. That was unusual for her these days. Instead, she simply sat slumped in the corner, staring at the floor. Jacob understood, and simply sat next to her, also in silence. She couldn't afford to yell, while so focused on holding back her tears. Over the coming days, the team returned to supply raids. Blowing the Pandorans apart seemed therapeutic to Sophia, and the project always had use for more resources. However, this particular mission was cut short by the panic-stricken voice of a Phoenix Point comms operator. He was screaming at Sophia that the egg had hatched. According to the frightened man, it was the end of the world. Cassius's team in Ginsburg received no such comms contact due to the legion of Pandoran flyers obliterating the Haven satellite array. Instead, their notification came in the form of the city's dam exploding and the sky being blackened by swarms of flying monstrosities. There were five members of Cassius's team, the captain himself, his second in command, a no-nonsense veteran by the name of Ellis Eckhart, the love of Cassius's life, Hannah Barrett, a foul-mouthed sniper in Evelyn Vanderberg, and their newest recruit, the Hammer. The five of them knew reaching the Manticore and hoping the repairs were finished was their only chance at survival. Huge sections of the city were flooded and Pandorans were literally falling from the sky. They double-timed it immediately. The team was faced with a stretch of ground to cross with almost no cover. They would be sitting ducks in such an environment, just waiting to be picked off by the swarming Pandorans. Ellis provided as much cover as he could with his grenade launcher, allowing the team to push forward. Pandorans approached them from all sides, the team having to balance firepower and movement. But the Pandorans were proving too much. Ellis was forced to abandon his rooftop position to save Hannah from the control of a mindfragger. In addition, the Pandorans were also launching Myrmidons at the city. Highly mobile, flying creatures that also packed an enormous punch with their razor-sharp talons. The situation grew more dire as multiple Pandorans had taken up position in the top level of a large building. They had the high ground and the squad was caught in a very open position. Ellis used his jetpack to take up the high ground himself. When a horde of Pandorans appeared in front of the Manticore, he annihilated them with explosive might. As the debris cleared, the Hammer and Hannah charged in, laying waste to the crippled remains of the Pandoran menace. Cassius, for his part, attempted suppressing fire into the high-rise building to try and contain the beasts within. Even if he couldn't make it to the Manticore himself, he would do everything in his power to ensure that his teammates would. The sheer ferocity and brutality of the team's assault seemed to cause hesitation within the Pandorans. Some of them panicked, fleeing to safety from the explosions and gunfire. It seemed they could feel fear after all. This gave Cassius the opening he needed to reach the rest of the squad. They rallied around the Manticore and made their escape. A Sinedrion who called herself Citizen Eileen was already aboard the vehicle with a handful of civilians and ready to take off. She wasn't sure the Manticore would hold together, but she realised it was the only hope they had of escape, and so the team was airborne. 
One of the Charons, the flying monstrosities of the Pandorans, turned its attention away from annihilating the Haven and pursued the squad. The team wasn't out of danger yet. They would need to fight their way through this beast if they wished to see the sunrise tomorrow. Up until this day, the skies had always belonged to humanity, but it seemed that was no longer the case. Thankfully, Eileen was an excellent pilot, keeping the team alive long enough to put down the enemy flyer. She then launched the vehicle full speed towards Phoenix Point. As the vehicle travelled away from the smouldering haven, Hannah gasped loudly. She was the first to see it. The hulking monstrosity that was no doubt responsible for launching the invasion of flyers. The thing was the size of a mountain. No conventional weapon would so much as scratch it. Hannah turned to Cassius and asked him how they were supposed to fight something like that. He only stared back at her. For the first time since she had known him, he didn't have an answer. And in that moment was when all hope left her. The situation was dire when Cassius resumed command of Phoenix Point. The political strife between him and Sophia was fracturing the project. People were choosing sides. In addition, Tobias West was demanding Helena be returned to New Jericho custody. After interrogating her for several hours, Cassius had concluded Helena was not insane, and there was sufficient evidence supporting her theories regarding the proto-civilization. The new leader's refusal to comply with West's demands only created further tension between the project and New Jericho. And as if all that wasn't enough, the behemoth, as it had come to be known, was wandering the countryside, laying waste to all in its path. No one had the faintest idea of how to so much as slow it down. The beast was clearly Pandoran in nature, and it seemed the war was over. Those unfortunate enough to still be alive were witnessing not any type of warfare, but merely humanity's extermination. And even so, there was yet another problem on the horizon for the project. A race of unhinged robotic warriors who called themselves the Pure. Beings who had their flesh replaced entirely with machinery. Just a human brain inside a metallic structure. The effect made them immune to the contagious properties of the Pandora virus, but the procedure had left all of them violently unstable. The Pure claimed to be failed experiments of Tobias West, but New Jericho would not be the only target of their wrath as they attempted a raid on the Sinedrian haven of Louverture. No doubt they wished to claim some of Sinedrion's advanced technology for themselves. Cassius's team was nearby, and they deployed to aid in repelling the invaders. Eileen had officially joined the squad. There was nothing left of her home, and if humanity truly was facing Armageddon, she intended to take down as many Pandorans as possible with her on the way out. The Pure were hulking monstrosities. The Sinedrion security forces attempted to quell the invaders, but their assault rifles did almost nothing to the thick, armoured exterior of the Pure. In addition, the metal monstrosities wielded energy shields that could block absorbent amounts of damage before they collapsed. The Pure seemed impervious to whatever the team threw at them. Cassius was able to make contact with a Sinedrion infiltrator who deployed several spider drones. Provided these devices could get close enough to the enemy, their self-destruct may be able to damage the Pure's armor and turn the tide of the battle. On the other side of the engagement zone, Evelyn was having more success. Her new Jericho sniper rifle packed enough punch to smash right through the Pure's armor, inflicting enormous damage. The target of her blow retaliated with heavy gunfire, causing deep wounds in Evelyn's flesh. Eileen proved her worth, covering Evelyn and felling the Pure with another sniper shot. While difficult, these twisted metal abominations could indeed be killed. The Pure had a sniper of their own who was terrorizing the battlefield. The drones began approaching the rifleman, and while he was able to down the first one, another was right behind and blew up in his face before he could react. 
This distraction gave Hannah and the Synedrion personnel the opportunity they needed to close in on the sniper. Hannah delivered the finishing blow, and the Haven had been saved. Meanwhile, Sophia's team was assisting the Disciples of Anu with a Pandoran attack of their own. While Cassius was no fan of the Disciples, he hadn't given any official directive that the project couldn't work with them. His view was that they were a necessary evil, as he described them. But this Haven defense was different. The team had an additional objective. Using the project's newly developed new razor technology, they were going to capture a live Pandoran specimen. Sophia had decided there was merit to Danchev's idea, but she was determined to do things the right way. The engineers at Phoenix Point had developed a containment chamber that they were certain would be impossible for any Pandoran creature to escape. Cassius had been adamantly opposed to the idea, but the science team managed to bring him around to the notion. They could learn a great deal about their enemy by interrogating a living creature. And so Omar took it upon himself to paralyze one of the beasts. The new razor was based on the Aspida's arm technology, though a much weaker version of it. Takeshi and Sophia found themselves able to paralyze a second Triton, and they abducted that one as well. The science team would be busy when the squad returned home. Meanwhile, many leagues away at the recently restored base of Phoenix Foxtrot, civilian personnel had finally moved in. Among them was an engineer by the name of Ethan Riles. Having witnessed the behemoth, and being quite sure he wasn't going to live out the month, Ethan had decided he would spend what little spare time he had replicating some of the Mad Maker's technology. He was particularly impressed with his own spin on the Chaos Buggy, which was capable of being controlled completely remotely. Surely such an achievement warranted a test drive. While Ethan was speeding down what used to be a major highway in the old world, he was surprised to pick up an automated message. The source appeared to be from a Synedrion Aspida, but there was no Synedrion Haven even remotely close to his location. Against his better judgement, and figuring he was already a dead man walking anyway, with the end of the world at hand and all, he decided to investigate. The Aspida had long been abandoned, it was run down, but appeared to be functional as far as Ethan could tell. But his panic set in when he realised why the Aspida's comm systems had randomly fired up. Pandorans were in the area. No doubt the message was an automatic response of the machine's AI, warning anyone nearby of the beast's presence. And he had been stupid enough to walk right into it. Ethan quickly retreated inside the vehicle and rushed to escape the area. Between the buggy's firepower and the Aspida's super-fast engine, he made his getaway quickly and safely. Ethan was incredibly proud of himself. He was no fighter, that much was for sure. But he had not only survived this encounter, but also obtained a valuable resource for the Phoenix Project. It was a shame, he thought, that none of them would be alive long enough to actually benefit from the vehicle. As time passed, Cassius diverted more and more of the engineer's focus on air-to-air -air weaponry. He was determined to take the fight to the behemoth, though he had no idea how to actually do so. For now, his strategy was to simply intercept any Charons that the behemoth launched at Havens. Eileen only became more confident with each skirmish, and the team found themselves actually able to hold their own against the flying menace. After several Charons had been destroyed by the Manticore's firepower, something staggering happened. The behemoth let out a grotesque and monumental cry of agony. It then began slowly lumbering towards the ocean and submerged itself. Somehow, defeating the Charons had caused some kind of reaction within the mighty creature. Whether it was in pain, it needed to replenish energy, or something else completely, the beast had been repelled, and for the first time since they had returned to Phoenix Point, Hannah noticed a smile on the captain's face. Celebrations were held throughout all the havens, praising the man who had defeated the behemoth. Cassius the Conqueror was the name he had been given. The captain himself, ironically, wasn't so convinced. As far as anyone knew, the behemoth was still alive, and Cassius was quite certain they had not seen the last of it.
But as quickly and unexpectedly as victory had been achieved against the behemoth, another crisis emerged. Cassius expected as much, he was used to it by this stage, but found himself frustrated at the ongoing setbacks all the same. No victory could ever be enjoyed. There was always another threat over the horizon. The transmission came from an independent haven that used to be associated with New Jericho. They had split from the faction over philosophical differences. And it was clear why. The scientists in the haven had created a new form of Pandoran. And it had escaped. Such callous research would never have been allowed under Tobias West's command. Cassius and the squad immediately deployed for the site. Upon their arrival, Cassius was shocked to find Sophia and Omar. Sophia was brandishing the shotgun her team had acquired at the marketplace. She explained that Jacob and the rest of her team were leading the evacuation of the civilians. She insisted that Omar and herself were there to back Cassius up, and he needed their support. She told the captain that Pandoran activity in the area was off the charts, more extreme than anything they had seen since the return of the mist. The creatures were appearing seemingly out of thin air. Cassius could hear the hint of anxiousness in Sophia's voice. She wasn't one to put her bravado aside so easily. She was worried. Cassius reluctantly agreed to the aid. He would have been a fool not to. He, of course, reminded the redhead that he was the one in charge of the operation. Ellis and Omar quickly used their jetpacks to move in and secure the turret control terminal. The system's power had been knocked out during the initial explosion that led to the Pandorans escaping. A system reboot was in order. The rest of the team began engaging the hostiles. They quickly learned Sophia's claims had indeed been true. There seemed an endless horde of the things, shambling down the main road towards their position. Some of the Tritons had apparently also learned how to wield Synedrion paralyzing technology. The beast took aim at Sophia, causing the joints in her armor to begin stiffening. Though she had been slowed down, this didn't stop her demonstrating the effectiveness of the Maker's weapons, as she converted an Arthron into bits with a single shot. While Sophia was proving her worth on the battlefield, Ellis had managed to activate the turrets. They began pummeling the Pandorans, quickly turning the battle in the Phoenix operative's favor. Once the city square was secured, the troops began heading further towards the research lab. And that is when the life form emerged. They would later come to know the thing as an Acheron. Some sort of demonic Pandoran-human hybrid. How had this atrocity been brought into existence? What evils had the scientists of this haven committed? And as it turned out, this creature was far more powerful than the mad scientists had ever envisioned. It was capable of psychic communication with other Pandorans for miles. The Acheron had been summoning reinforcements for days, amassing an army right under the Haven's nose. And the people of this wretched place soon found themselves the victims of their own creation. With a bellowing roar, the creature blasted a stream of vile purple sludge at Evelyn. She screamed out in agony, her muscles convulsing and bile spewing out of her mouth. It was Sophia, of all people, who clutched her tightly with one arm, protecting her head from twitching into the concrete. With her other arm, Sophia took aim at the abominable being and blasted it into oblivion. Evelyn's condition soon stabilized, but there were still a great many Pandorans to deal with. As the turrets continued laying down fire, one of them clipped Cassius. His legs were punctured with several bullets as he cried out in pain. As the captain hobbled to a safer position, he was stunned to see Sophia already there waiting for him. She jammed the med kit into him with more force than was strictly necessary and the device began sucking the bullets out of his flesh and filling in his wounds. How had she reached him so quickly? As the troops mopped up the last of the Pandorans, Cassius came to an understanding. Sophia's armor seemed to be enhancing her speed and reflexes beyond that of what was previously thought possible for a human being. The weapons her team wielded could single-handedly turn the tide of a battle. She may have been a reckless hothead, but there was a method to her madness. 
She was a woman who had been given an impossible task, and so had taken whatever steps necessary to keep her people alive. Perhaps, Cassius was begrudgingly forced to think to himself, just perhaps, he had been too harsh on her. With the area clear, both teams proceeded into the facility. Amongst the bodies was some extremely advanced tech. No doubt the scientists and engineers back at base would have their hands full with this discovery. But there was something else, and it was, undoubtedly, the worst scenario imaginable. The research logs confirmed that multiple of the broken stasis chambers had been housing Acherons. There were more of those rancid creatures, and they were long gone, out in the world somewhere, no doubt waiting to strike once more. Cassius realised the gravity of their situation. It had taken all they had to take down one of these beasts, let alone more of them. And so he made some rather stunning changes to the Phoenix Project. From now on, Sophia's team would be referred to as Alpha Squad, and his team, Bravo Squad. It was a clear show of respect to give his own team the secondary allocation, and Sophia was smart enough to realise this. He also instructed Sophia to venture to the Americas and find Danchev's so-called living weapons, as well as to find Symes. And when she had, Cassius promised they would bring him home together. The two squad leaders exchanged a firm handshake before Sophia led her team back to the Alpha Squad Manticore. Their journey was only just beginning. All the roads we travel, the journey of our lives, take another picture before we say goodbye. Memories fade, but legends never die One last time, let's live for something I can feel my blood, it's rushing This ain't goodbye, we'll be back someday And we will find our own way Take control of our fate And like a car with no brakes Cassius had decided he would reside as judge during the trial of the few surviving scientists who created the Acherons. As the Phoenix personnel sifted through the evidence from the lab, they discovered the horrifying truth. Not only had these so-called scientists been merging live humans and Pandorans together, but the subjects had been used against their will. The Haven was nothing more than a den of depravity, in which corrupt politicians and bureaucrats subjected the population to unimaginable abuse in order to satisfy their own lust for power. Their reprehensible addiction to playing God. It was the old world all over again. Cassius told the scientists that his teammates had recommended a firing squad as punishment. The scientists panicked at this statement but Cassius assured them he would not allow any such acts of barbarism. After all, as Cassius himself explained, bullets were a precious commodity in the new world. There was no reason to waste them. Instead, he ordered the scientists to be detained at the base. They would be held inside the Pandoran containment facility.